Hey, Sarah. Yes, Alex? Would you consider yourself a relationship anarchist? Mm, I'm more of a relationship centrist. <laughs> what does that mean? Uh, it means I'm always trying to help people come together. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to Mistakes Were Made, a podcast about non-monogamy for messy people like us. I'm Sarah. I'm a queer, non-monogamous therapist, parent, writer, and anarchist since before I knew what that meant. And I'm her husband, Alex. Uh, I also identify as an anarchist, but nobody believes me because I just look like a normie middle-aged dad. (laughs) Oh, we have to get you some more like chains and collars Mm -hmm. and tattoos on your neck. Yeah. We'll work on that. <laughs> and I'm Jessica here producing, resident monogamist, also an anarchist, but terrified that someone's going to make me explain exactly what that means. Just send them oh. to me. Yeah. yeah, that's what I do. That's what I do. <laughs> and in fact, that's why we put together this entire episode. Right. And then I'll be like, what are definitions anyway, if not just an oppressive system that we've been conscripted into? We have to dismantle it. We've got to dismantle the very definition. <laughs> okay, you guys, sorry, sorry. rein it in. We do have a guest. Yes, we have a guest. Who's going to help us with this? We are interviewing today. We welcome today Max Hill to the podcast. Uh, Max is a teacher, graphic designer, and caretaker of the Relationship Anarchy Smorgasbord, which we all learned about and actually explored a little bit last night. Dined at. We dined at it last night. (laughs) Feasted upon it. Um, So the Relationship Anarchy Smorgasbord is a resource that uh, Max uh, and others have put together and grown over time that is essentially, as I understand it, to sort of help people understand all of the dimensions of uh, their relationships or things that could be in their relationships um, and like help them make more kind of like affirmative choices about that rather than kind of defaulting to um, the defaults. Yeah, (laughs) I would say it's a tool um, increasingly, I've been suggesting this tool to clients of mine who are newly polyamorous and kind of trying to understand what it looks like to make a relationship, multiple relationships with more partners? How do you know what everyone is looking for? How do you build language around that? How do you kind of build those containers that we talk about a lot on the podcast? Yeah, okay. It's very new to me. I mean, I only looked at it at first a couple weeks ago, and uh, I was surprised there was not as many cured meats involved. (laughs) (laughs) Those little Nordic crackers. Uh So that's a note for Max. (laughs) But it kind of looks like, just to give a sense of what we're talking about, it's um, there's like three concentric circles um, and then a lot of smaller circles inside those big circles. And they list different things like communication frequency, physical intimacy, caregiving. um, And those like more inner circles are more sort of intimate or having to do with your physical body and then as you go outwards there's things like um legal or technology like sharing a netflix account for example um but so sort of all of these different dimensions and there's a lot like two dozen of these little platters each with a label and things to pick from yeah and my first thought and to be clear i've been suggesting that other people do this but i hadn't done it yet (laughs) come on come on um One of my first thoughts upon looking at this and doing it with the two of you last night, and I also um, went through it with a new partner a couple of weeks ago for the first time, is just how little we actually talk about all the different potential dimensions of Mm. relationships, Mm -hmm. uh, especially intimate relationships, Mm -hmm. which I think as we talk about a lot on this podcast, in a world of kind of conscripted monogamy, you're like, well, you meet, you sleep together, you become exclusive, then you get a house and you have a family together and that's it. Those are the only things that you're going to be talking about. That's what your relationship is. Shut up. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, and it raises the question, like, what is intimacy? Like we think about intimacy, I guess, as a euphemism for sex, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, But it means a lot more and sometimes things that aren't uh, sexual, which is... um, maybe a good place to start with yeah. our conversation about it that we did last night around our uh our our thruple our three 
legged stool relationship. Our life partnership. Uh, one of the just for transparency's sake, one of the little platters in the smorgasbord was about labels and terms. Mm. And Jessica and Alex and I, who have been in partnership with each other for two decades now at this point, mm-hmm. realized that we never worked that mm-hmm. shit out. Yeah, we never really discussed it. <laughs> yeah. And then I referred to you as my life partner <laughs> last night in a text while we were having the conversation. I was like, ooh, interesting. <laughs> yeah, and we were like, we experimented with like... Chosen family. Chosen family, mm-hmm. you know, and then we were like, well, you're our kid's aunt, but also right. like a little bit more of a co-parent, but also like godmom, but also, you know... Yeah. We own a, an LLC, a limited liability oh, yeah. corporation Business together. Business co-owners. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. Jessica and I work in the same place sometimes. True. Mm-hmm. So what was interesting about this, is, if I may, can I just like kind of dive in mm-hmm. on what yeah, we... Yeah, please do. What we checked. We went around and each one of us chose three of the platters that we wanted to discuss more thoroughly. And then... That didn't even get to half of the platters. So there's many platters that you could be talking about. Um, And then we went around and explored the concept. So the ones that we chose in that first round that applied, we all felt like applied to our relationship as life partners, which is where we landed Mm -hmm. on terms, um, were co-caregivers, professional and work, collaborators, financial, uh, spiritual, future plans, Time spent together, labels and terms, legal, and creative. Mm. So those were just the first round of ones that we ended up talking about. And I'd be curious to hear from you two, what were your reflections in that first kind of round? What did it get you thinking about? I think, yeah, it's interesting. So many of those feel like, I mean, we just, we have lived together and worked together and made creative work together for so, so long that so many of them feel very like settled and not the way, like when I've been in relationships and you have the conversation about exclusivity or whatever, or like, are we boyfriend, girlfriend, girl, whatever labels. That's Mm -hmm. what I'm looking for. Mm -hmm. It's like scary. Human friend. (laughs) Intimate human friend. (laughs) (laughs) Um, (laughs) <laughs> IHFs. <laughs> <laughs> but so, uh, but like future plans was one of the ones that I picked. And I feel like that's maybe the only one of the ones that we talked about that just feels a little, even though I feel very like secure in the fact that we will make future plans together. Maybe I'm just like scared about what is going to happen right. in the future in like general. Unsettled, yeah. So that one felt a little like mm-hmm. fluttery. Mm-hmm. Um, And it was interesting, like, I was glad that it, doing this tool kind of, like, gave us a reason to talk about that, you Mm -hmm. know, to, like, even surface that, like, oh, this is a thing that I think we all are on the same page about, but it's valuable to make it visible. Yeah, and I think it's something that is valuable for, you know, I guess, in in theory for people at the beginning of relationships, and we can talk about this more with the guest, but also for people who are in the middle of relationships, and it's not just, it's, like, a little bit scary, but it's not just about talking about uh, things that you aren't doing or don't want to do mm-hmm. or things that you do want to start doing, but you're not sure if the other person or people do, but also like kind of like affirming the dimensions of your relationship and how important they are, mm-hmm. um, you know, and how, for instance, for us, like how multitudinous our <laughs> relationship <laughs> quite is. Multitudinous. It's quite multitudinous. <laughs> um, you know, and there are all of these things that I might not think about at any one time without like sort of intentionally looking at it, like mm-hmm. um, the level of, you know, like creative trust that we have with each other. Like that doesn't come easily. That shit was harder. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, right. And yeah. at some point we decided we wanted to do that together. And then like we worked through and got really good at it. And the same thing with like, you know, legal or financial, like the ways that we like entered into uh, those kind of like shared community home ownership, communal living stuff. Like, yeah, you know, it's all there's a lot there's a lot you can do that's not just sex. <laughs> sure is. And it turns out we're doing all of those things. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Every, everything on the smorgasbord that is not sex, basically. Right. Mm-hmm. The only ones that we didn't end up uh, kind of checking as relevant to our three person relationship here was physical intimacy, sexual power exchange and kink. Um, 
power and hierarchy and exclusivity. Yeah. So yeah. I'm looking at there's probably like 24 on here or something like that. Mm-hmm. So that's only five yeah. that didn't apply to our relationship. Mm. And we probably came up with even with some of those, like even with exclusivity, like there are some levels upon which we are exclusive, right? Like mm. we live in this house and like uh, yeah. exclusively, right? <laughs> like it would be a big discussion among all of us to bring in another person to live here or to bring in another key member of this podcast production team or something like right. that. Like there are certain things that are like just us. Okay, guys. <laughs> Don't even try. Don't try to bring your girlfriend to be <laughs> on our podcast. Yeah, <laughs> not in my tent. <laughs> but what was so interesting, and maybe this is like a nice segue into um, talking to Max a little bit more about what relationship anarchy means. This is a tool of relationship anarchy. Right. And essentially the term that they are using is uh, it wasn't co-creating. It was, oh, customizing commitments mm, mm, um, yeah. as an expression of relationship anarchy or building up alternative relationships while interrogating uh, kind of unexamined or, or hurtful ones. And so what I thought about, I was so appreciative of this exercise and I realized like the relationship the three of us have is incredibly unique and robust and amazing and really, really non-traditional and d- different. <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, and that was cool. And it was just like an example of how we, like maybe many other people out there, are probably already practicing some relationship anarchy without knowing it. Mm. Yeah. Sweet. Nice. Awesome. I'm so excited See? for this interview. <laughs> Even though I look normal. Uh. I'm not. <laughs> um, <laughs> All right, well, uh, the resource is linked um, in the show notes, so if you want to take a look at see what it looks like, there's a bunch of different kind of formats that you can uh, take a look at. But, and follow um, along. Yeah, follow along. Okay, great. Let's dive in. So, yeah, maybe as a first question, like, is uh, is related, do you feel like relationship anarchy is kind of like having a, a moment um, right now? It's like certainly, I think, a thing that uh, we've been hearing more and more people mm-hmm. talk about. And as we said, uh, off mic earlier, like, um, this is an episode that we wanted to do for, for quite some time to, uh, just kind of like get more information about what does it mean? Um, you know, how are people thinking about it and, and maybe like, why are more people being attracted to it? I have no idea if it's having a moment now or not, because I have been like up to my eyeballs in it. Um, for nearly 10 years. Um, and a lot of the, and this may just be a symptom of Facebook being Facebook, but like, I was really getting like cutting my teeth in a a number of different Facebook groups, um, talking about polyamory and relationship anarchy and stuff and, and solo polyamory. Um, and that's where I was getting a lot of the feedback in some of the earlier versions, um, that I worked on of the smorgasbord. And a lot of those has just kind of like gotten real quiet the last few years, though I will say the relationship anarchy Facebook page has, has had a resurgence of late of just consistent, not like dozens of posts a day, but like people consistently asking questions and good engagement and stuff. Um, so um, I don't know. It might be. Um, I, I hang out with a lot of like anarchists who have been talking about this for a long time. Um, uh, so I don't know what, uh, I don't know what the normies are thinking. I don't know what the, I don't know what the normies are getting exposed to. Um, but I believe you if you're saying there's a resurgence or there's like it's more a thing people are talking about now. I believe you. <laughs> I feel like I hear more about relationship anarchy than I do about political anarchy. So maybe that points to, mm. uh, yeah, what's what's out there. People aren't hanging yeah, out. I think that's interesting. Enough. Um. <laughs> yeah. I, I would say probably part of the reason why it's feeling like more of a trend in my life is because of getting involved in the pro-Palestine protests and mm. conversations about anarchy, anarchism, and uh, by extension, relationship anarchy are, are all part of that milieu. Um, and I would say, like, just also anecdotally on dating apps, mm. I think you see more people talking about it and expressing 
you know, identifying as a relationship anarchist. And again, among folks that I'm working with, there are a lot of people who are like, what, what does relationship anarchy mean? I feel like I might be drawn to it. I'm not sure if I know, uh, if I am drawn to it or not. So that's, that's kind of the reason why I would say it's having, it cool. might be a mini moment. It might be that it's having a moment in my life. And I'm rejecting that. <laughs> I, I, that could be possible. <laughs> Um, um, but Max, you were referencing the smorgasbord as a big part of how you engage in the work of uh, talking about relationship anarchy and being in that community. Would you just introduce it for our listeners and yeah, your relationship to it? So um, sometime in 2015, 2016, um, I read about relationship anarchy heard about the manifesto read the manifesto went holy shit in a good way like this is this is a thing this is a thing people are actually doing and it is through engaging in like with the manifesto finding online communities of other people who are trying to um, figure out what relationship anarchy means, figuring out what anarchy means in relation to relationship anarchy. Um, say that four times fast. Um, in the, in the uh, manifesto, there's like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Not, wow, okay, I estimated that pretty good. Um, so there's nine kind of bullet points and b- basic concepts that Andy Nordgren uh, published um, as part of the manifesto. And the last one of those is customizing your commitments. Um, and that one, I think, is one of the easier and less esoteric concepts for people to be exposed to because it's a little bit more practical. And you can give examples of, um, for example, one of the best examples I really loved about customizing commitments um, in relation to relationship anarchy is like, say you have a person that you have been friends with, that you have been through thick and thin, thin with, you know how you handle conflict, etc. cetera. Um, you have similar ways that you want to like raise children. So instead of trying to raise children with romantic partners where they come and go and you don't have stable relationships with romantic partners, why not? choose to co-parent children with someone that's actually been a stable force in your life and that you know you're on the same page about and you can rely on each other in a way that you've never been able to rely on romantic partnerships. Like, oh, wow, what a fucking concept. Um, Is like you can actually just do what makes the most sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that you can build relationships that work for the people inside the relationships instead of trying to fit people into existing definitions well, it's, just to say it like that is pretty subversive right to to do mm-hmm. you know those big life things in uh ways that are very different than than the ways that you're sort of the default ways that you're told to do that more it's expected that you would do that right yes and like it's it is very subversive in the like Euro American culture that we live in now. And that like, I'm looking around this video call and I'm seeing very pale faces. So I'm going to make an assumption that most of us have the experience of being white people in America. Am I correct? Okay. Yep. Yes. Um, I don't know if that's true of all of your listeners. Um, and one of the things that I have learned is I have studied history talked to people who do not have the same upbringing that I did, that different ways of relating are so much more common. Different ways of building family structures, different ways of customizing relationships are so much more common if you step out of the, I was going to say Brady Bunch, but even Brady Bunch was subversive for its time because you had two (laughs) people who were getting married with their own children. And that that, that show was almost like a whole thing about trying to show that like blended families can just look like a normal family. Um, You know, so, but there is still a lot of like normativeness 
in shows like the Brady Bunch that were trying to um, exemplify a certain kind of white American familyness. Um, so I think, I think customizing relationships and just knowing that you can do that is subversive, especially for folks who um, have felt a lot of pressure to conform to particular ways of being and existing. Um, I mean, yeah. And to your point about race and privilege, not only pressure to conform, um, but not a lot of modeling for other ways of living. Yeah. Um, and really narrow kind of conscripted, uh, definitions of how you live and love and relate to each other. And for, I think for a lot of white Americans in particular, uh, it does feel subversive because it's like, Oh wait, there's something else. And especially white, mm, white Americans who maybe also grew up with a real straight as norm, Mm -hmm. uh, kind of milieu as well. Yes, definitely. Mm -hmm. Um, definitely. Um, so for me, encountering the smorgasbord for the first time, um, was like, like getting smashed in the face in the best possible way with like, oh, other people are thinking about this. Um, like I, it's like when I started to look into political and philosophical anarchy, it was, or like when I finally actually met like people who are living collectively. I was like, oh, these things that I have dreamed about doing and have wanted to do my entire life, but didn't have any models for, I just kind of had to like dip my head below the surface of Americana and, and just started running into it everywhere. Um, and so the, the smorgasbord is like a visual metaphor where in where you imagine you and another person get to customize your relationship. You get to go, what exactly and precisely and how much do we want to do various things in our relationship? And it's organized in platters, sort of like if you're at a buffet. So smorgasbord is just like another word for buffet. Um, so imagine you're at a buffet. Good. I'm glad you addressed this. I, I was going to ask. Yes. <laughs> what the um, heck is this board is just a buffet. It's Swedish. Like, yes. Yes. Um, I, sometimes I forget that it's like a different language because I think of where I grew up. There's just certain words are just, maybe, maybe it's not even where I grew up, but I think that's where my dad grew up. There's just rando words from other languages that I don't realize, um, are not English words. Um, so you had a pre-existing then, affinity for smorgasbords before the, the yeah. relationship smorgasbord? Yep. But that's not required to use it, I don't think, right? No, no, definitely not required. Um, it Like, if, if I was to explain, like, if we were to expand this metaphor into, like, you know, improv acting class style, um, you and another person are standing together holding a plate. A, sh- a large shared plate. And that plate is the relationship that the two of you are building together. And you have a whole buffet. And this buffet does not have great practices around um, allergens because there are multiple things on the same, on, on different platters. It's a little <laughs> bit more like a potluck in that way, I think. Um, <laughs> so there's all these different platters and they're all on this big table. And apparently all of the spoons are long enough that you can reach in and like not spill things everywhere. Um, (laughs) I'm really getting into this in a way I wasn't expecting. (laughs) Um, (laughs) Read the picture, Max. (laughs) Um, And so the two of you decide, okay, what do we want on our plate that we're going to take back to our table and we're going to share a meal together? Like what exactly? Do we want to do some co-parenting? Well, I'm I'm cool with co-parenting a pet but I don't want to co-parent a human being or like, I would love to co-parent plants in a garden with you. Like some people think of plants as a parenting kind of thing. And there is a level of like keeping things alive that I can see that too. Um, What about some monogamy? How do you feel about exclusivity? Actually, I'm not in, I'm not, uh, I'm not chill with exclusivity or 
Um, I'm fine with um, us having us having a p- particular television shows we watch together, like when the new episodes come out, right? There are like, these can be like big life decision stuff or like maybe just little things. Um, but that matter a lot, right? Some people, it matters a lot if they're reading a book together or watching a show together to, for that to be their thing, right? Um, and it's what I found as I started exploring and thinking about and working with the Smorius board um, is it's like I added the subtitle. It's a tool for discussion, right? It's not a be all end all. It's not going to fix everything. It's not going to make everything come together in a beautiful way, but it can help you figure out if you can make a compatible plate back to that, you know, allergen discussion. If someone's like, I cannot, have uh, vetoes involved in any of like m- the people that are connected to me. Like, like you can't, someone else can't have veto power over my relationship with you and you can't have veto power over my relationship with anybody else. That's not allowed. And if you're going to bring this platter back to a table or this plate that you've built together back to a table that has a bunch of other plates on it that are being shared amongst a bunch of people. And there's a veto on that table. That person's like, Hey, no, I cannot. This is a, this is a hard line for me. I can't, I can't make a plate with you. Right. So it's helpful for being able to have a, conversation that addresses a bunch of different things that may or may not be deal breakers, really important, necessary, et cetera, um, for people to feel safe, seen, held, and respected in a relationship. As a relationship therapist, I also have started using it for folks who are already in long-term relationships. So a little bit the way you're describing it, it's like, well, what relationship are we going to create together? And I also think that it's really helpful for people to start finding language and being able to communicate around what is the relationship we're currently in. And I think that kind of goes Mm -hmm. back to what you were describing before about this like narrow conscription into intimate relationships that some of us maybe many of us have experienced based on culture um, and background. And a lot of people, and I have had this experience too, of being in really, really long relationships and then being like, wait, what are we doing? What's, <laughs> what, is, what is going on? What are our shared values? Um, how did we end up here? I think there's a lot of, um, especially around monogamous culture, there's just like this one type of contract that you tend to enter into and it doesn't really go, it's not really examined or discussed. And then all yeah. other relationships are outside of that contract and somehow also not really discussed, <laughs> but that's the way it can sometimes feel to me. And I think this tool, the, um, the smorgasbord is really helpful in that respect as well. Yes. Um, the first time I like sat down with the smorgasbord and was using it as a tool was with a friend of mine who we'd been friends for maybe almost 10 years at that point. And we had been dancing around mutual attraction for a long time. And one or the other of us was always in like a place where it was not something we could pursue. And so for the first time we were like, Oh, I think this is something that we can pursue actually. And so we like set a time to like meet up at a coffee shop and like sit down with the, like we had, we had, um, I sent, I sent them the smorgas, the original smorgas board. And we used like little, literally like different colors of marking on our phones to indicate different things that we were like green light, go yellow light, maybe red light, no kind of deal. And then we like set aside time to like after we had exchanged those, sit down and have a conversation. So like it was sitting down with the smorgasbord was like, okay, we have been friends for a really long time. We know where we're at and we're going to take a big, we're going to shift things real fast. Like, like, like from considering how long we've been friends, this is a big shift we're going to be taking and we want to do so intentionally. 
And um, it was in that conversation that I started to realize the things that were missing from the Smorgas board. Mm. The first of which is I'm pagan. (laughs) It's a thing that is imbued in my entire life. It's not a thing that I can like pretend isn't true for me. And And even if, even if there's someone in my life that I know, like I just like, this is just not on the table as a discussion point. I need to assess that pretty early on. Um, if I, if like, this is going to squick somebody out or something. Um, so it's just like an important thing that I was like, Oh, I need to discuss this. So what was never called version two, but is version two, um, was the relationship anarchy smorgasbord for the spiritually minded. And I, added the spirituality uh, platter and a couple other things. And instead of it being a table with like rows and columns, I made ovals because I'm a graphic designer and I can make ovals (laughs) um, in the programs I have access to. Um, (laughs) So I could make it look like the platters that were being talked about. I didn't change a lot of the other language. Like up until version six, there were still typos from version one in my (laughs) smorgasbord um (laughs) so which is kind of charming actually (laughs) oh thank you um (laughs) i mean i feel like there should be a copy editing element that could be on there like are you allowed to copy edit other people's your partner's typos (laughs) in their content or do they not want to hear it um i think that's part of um create co-creation like creativity what yeah. let, me look, let me look at the smorgasbord you could but no that sounds right totally um let me just look at this real quick um yeah that would be under uh creative um and um uh where is it where to go um well it's not there is there writing somewhere <gasps> have we forgotten writing it's not in creative Ooh, okay. Note. Note. <laughs> All right. We yeah, came up we're with some new So I want... Oh, go ahead. I, well, I wanted to back up a little bit, and I was recognizing that customizing commitments is, like, the part of relationship anarchy that got us into talking about the smorgasbord, which is an incredible exercise for understanding... The relationships you're in, the ones you want to be in, the ones you want to make with other people. Um, But I personally wanted to just ask a broader question, which is, what is relationship anarchy for the 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 newest among us uh, who think that Mm. there's something that their ears prick up about when they hear that word? uh, How would you describe it to them as a first intro? So a lot of people hear about, that's a great question. A lot of people hear about relationship anarchy within the context of polyamory and non-monogamy. They, they hear about it in relation to talking about non-normative ways of having romantic and or sexual relationships. And I think the biggest kind of baseline understanding that I want people to have about relationship anarchy is it's not just about your romantic and or sexual relationships. It's about how you approach all of your relationships with every person. I'm not saying you have to sit down with a smorgasbord with your mailman. Okay. Like that's not what I'm saying. Um, what I'm saying is that it's it's a way of applying the principles of self-organization, um, autonomy, but also recognizing interdependence and responsibility. Like all of these things are are woven together. And I was just reading a thing earlier today, um, like kind of there was a person sort of bemoaning a bunch of folks who will identify on dating apps as relationship anarchists but their behavior um doesn't show any of that um sense of social responsibility 
you know, for, for the consequences of one's actions. Um, and, you know, someone was like, um, relationship anarchy is just a practical application of political anarchy. That's all it is. Like, like very simply, I'm like discussing like political anarchy is both incredibly simple and incredibly complex because part of the part of the process of understanding anarchy is deconstructing and dismantling all the ways that capitalism and colonization and racism and 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 have fucked us up have hurt everyone some people more than others, but it hurts. These systems hurt everybody. And like, there are a lot of really beautiful, simple catchphrases, like from each according to their ability to each according to their need. Right? Where, like, that I, that I think give people these beautiful little windows into what is possible, right? Um, but without digging into breaking down, dismantling, and constantly, I know it's exhausting, but constantly interrogating your own prejudices, biases, and... Um, paradigms that you're walking into life with because of the world you were raised in, you're going to keep bumping up against ways in which you're treating people shitty because to quote the minimalist podcast, you're treating people as things. Um, I think they're quoting other people anyway, but, um, So I think, I think if I was to try to like explain relationship anarchy to somebody who didn't know about like political anarchy, which is where I was actually coming into it. I had not met an anarchist in person um, at that point. And I was like, it, so, so, and, and for a lot of people, relationship anarchy is actually their first introduction to practical anarchy. Um, mm-hmm. I would kind of say in a really rose colored kind of way that another way of existing in this world and interacting with people is possible ways that empower you and ways that empower the people around you ways that you can get to be all of who you are and don't feel like you have to slaughter parts of yourself that aren't acceptable. Yeah. And I was thinking about that intersection between political anarchy and relationship anarchy. And I realized it's, it's a false divide uh, because Mm -hmm. of course, Politics are relational, relationships are political. These things are constantly informing each other. Um, And I was thinking about how one of the ways I sometimes talk about anarchy, and and usually I'm talking about political anarchy, is this idea of intentionally identifying existing systems and dismantling them while also building up new alternatives that work for the people who inhabit those systems. And like, that kind of tension all the time. How do we dismantle and build up at the same time? And and I see that so well represented in relationship anarchy in the smorgasbord, right? Like, let's talk about these kind of conscripted systems. How do we dismantle them while building up an alternative uh, at the same time? Which I think is a really uh, powerful mm, way of contradicting the kind of cultural assumption that like anarchy is chaotic and selfish and violent um and in fact it is exactly the opposite of all of those things 
the listeners cannot hear me, but I am rolling my eyes at all of that. That that anarchy is we chaos. We need a sound effect like, for eye rolls. <laughs> um, there's a podcast I listen to where they literally will like, they just say like, and I'm nodding, um, like to different things. Like they they just <laughs> nodding. Um, uh, yeah, it's. I was getting chills and getting a super big grin on my face when you were talking about the smorgasbord exemplifying the tearing down while also building up parallel systems um, is kind of the way that I hear it phrased a lot um, is, is building up parallel systems um, so that we can support ourselves and each other um, as the shitty systems are dismantled. Because when we dismantle mm-hmm. shitty systems, it hurts people, right? Like mm-hmm. there are people's, like we, there are ways that people's lives are built upon the foundation of these shitty systems. Even as they're hurting them, their lives are built on them. And mm-hmm. so if we do not create parallel systems to support them before we start busting up the machinery (laughs) there's nothing to catch them right and so i'm really glad i don't think i've had anybody tell me that the smorgasbord is an is an example of that parallel system and i feel really great about it Mm. um because i love it (laughs) that's 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 what i've been trying to do though i didn't realize it's what i've been trying to do but that's what i've been trying to do Uh is i've been trying to help people help themselves and each other to create and build and foster healthier ways of relating. I want to come back to something that you said uh, when you were describing your first like application of the smorgasbord with a, um, somebody you were in relationship with. Um, what really jumped out for me was just like thinking about how vulnerable of a conversation that is of like a kind of conversation to have um, and I think that it's, you know, it's because we're always kind of like having those negotiations or that those sort of conversations. But when you have the sort of default assumptions and the default like systems that exist and you're operating inside of those and you're sort of spared of having to put sort of everything out there on the table as a possibility and everything out there on the table as a as a non possibility um, and and you can you just kind of have a path to follow. But even when we follow that path, like you know things like like flirtation and the way that you like build a relationship with a new person you're still kind of doing that same thing of like do you want this but i'm pretending that i don't really mm-hmm. you know like oh i'm just i'm actually just joking haha <laughs> i didn't want that unless you do want it in which case yes i want it too um and like we're so used to doing that but that having a really direct conversation about it where you're really like looking at this entire like array of possible things and saying, do you want this with me? It's like, that's an extremely vulnerable thing to do, right? It's like, it's pretty scary. Um, So (laughs) I don't know what I have to say with all that other than just like, I'm curious about your observations of that. Has it gotten easier for you over time? Do you do it with new people that you meet? Um, Are you careful about kind of like who you enter into those conversations with? How do you think about that? Um, so this is the funny thing. I was just talking about this yesterday. Um, I haven't actually sat down with the smorgasbord TM, anybody that I am currently in a romantic relationship with. (laughs) Um, and in fact, I have not, like, none of my current relationships are based upon and like smorgasbord conversation right and Mm -hmm. part of that i think is because the people that i've been relating with most recently are also political anarchists to varying degrees or have experience with this kind of dismantling process and so like one of my one of my partners like they took I think it was like version five of the smorgasbord and wrote them on cards so we could just pull up and like on a phone conversation just like talk about each platter 
um, and just kind of get a sense of where we we're at. That was like two or three years ago. And things have changed since then. Um, and I think for me also the biggest thing is that I'm immunocompromised. And with the with the abandonment of folks like me and the sacrifice of folks like me on the altar of going back to normal, um, the possibility and thus the interest in making new connections with people is in the fucking floor. Like I just, it, the, I have such a high bar of entry at this point for vulnerability, like phys like physical vulnerability with people. Like when I, like the partner I was just talking about, like they live in a collective with a bunch of people and not everybody's on the same page about COVID. So I haven't been able to kiss that person in over three years. And, um, like they live in the same town as me, like 10 minutes away, but like we have to be really intentional about our, the time that we share together. And there's just a lot of stuff that's off the table right now, not because either one of us are, are choosing it, but because of the knock on effect of the choices that other people are making. Right. Um, and so I feel like I'm in a very odd position as a person who has spent so much time and energy creating this tool, but also not being a person who uses it regularly anymore. Mm -hmm. um, and I think part of that is because, like I said earlier, I've kind of internalized this way of thinking. And so I have these conversations all the time informally. I kind of don't do small talk anymore. Um, mm -hmm. I gave up a long time ago and I kind of don't get along with people who require it. So we just start having the smorgasbord conversation before there's a smorgasbord on the table. Um, mm -hmm. another one of my partners really wants to create a smorgasbord specifically for kink and BDSM and has done some mm -hmm. sketching of it because like, They've looked at they've looked at the smorgasbord and been like, power exchanging kink. There's a lot more to that. I was like, I know. Uh -huh. This is a beginning of a conversation. This isn't the <laughs> whole conversation. Um, uh, but it would be helpful to have a tool that ha that goes into more of the minutia. Um, rather than all, like, I don't know how familiar y'all or your listeners are with, um, like kink, BDSM and power exchange and things like that is there's often these like extensive spreadsheet lists of like, uh, thousands of different kinds of kinks and activities and stuff. And they're boring <laughs> and monotonous, mm -hmm. <laughs> but they're also very useful tools, right? Like if, mm -hmm. if you're really trying to figure out what is or is not on the table, because a lot of the things that people are into are also hard fucking no's for people. And it's important to know what those are. Um, and it's even more important to know what are people's hell yes, you know? Um, so does that answer your question? <laughs> yes, I think so. I have a, I have a quick follow-up question, which is, um, as a, if you're a person who's out there, who's not sort of identified with relationship anarchy already, and you were to see somebody on a dating app, who like said, you know, I ascribe to relationship anarchy or like um, identified with with that. Um, are those two things like mutually exclusive? Should like relationship anarchists only be dating other relationship anarchists? Um, mm. And how, like, how do you think about that? Or how do you how do you think people should think about that? Because I think that there's a little bit of uh, maybe similar to political anarchy. There's like a lot of misunderstanding of relationship anarchy. And it's like kind of maybe because of this vulnerability thing it's like uh, intimidating. I think so, some people, and I probably like we kind of, as we've talked about it, like in the past, like it seems sort of intimidating the idea that like there wouldn't be scripts. Um, so 
I definitely don't think relationship anarchists only need to date other relationship anarchists. Um, like one of my partners who is an anarchist does not identify as a relationship anarchist. They like, they understand these things is very different. Um, in part because of their relational style, like how, like, you know, looking back on their whole life, these are the kinds of relationships I end up in. I'm not going to explain that cause that's kind of their business, but like, you know, they understand how they end up in like how they like to have their relationships, what makes them feel f- happy and fulfilled. And it's like, they're also coming from at relationship anarchy, like looking at it from the perspective of someone who's done political anarchist action. Like, so it's very interesting looking at, actually, I think, I think this might be true of (laughs) both of my partners right now, um, is that, uh, they both are looking at this from people who've been like anarchist activists before they heard the term relationship anarchist. And so it's very interesting kind of coming at this from different directions. Um, Mm -hmm. um, If someone's on a dating app and they see that, you know, it says someone's profile says relationship anarchy, there are definitely people who um, will use the term relationship anarchy without doing any of that dismantling work and use it kind of as a get out of jail free card for not giving a shit about other people's emotions and the concept, the, the knock on effects of their behavior. And then there's also people who do do that kind of dismantling work and do understand that their actions and their behavior has consequences and they have a responsibility to the people they're in relationship with. And I think sort of the first step, if it was me would be to suss out where the, where they're at. And so I would just ask them, what does relationship anarchy mean to you? And I think you'll get a pretty clear answer pretty quickly what that is um, and how to navigate. Like some people are like, yeah, I, I totally want just a fuck boy. Great. Love it. They don't need, they don't want, they don't need somebody who is going to like spend half of their date or three quarters of their date discussing political anarchy with them. Like maybe that's not what they want. It's fine. Like if you just want to bang somebody, great. More power to you. Um, but it's just, I think it's a good thing to define your terms. If you're going to use a term that people are using in a, with a variety of different definitions. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah. So. Yeah. And I think sometimes I hear folks coming to relationship anarchy in the same way they might with political anarchy, really um, hyped up about the autonomy piece and maybe not as hyped up and just skilled around the interdependence mm-hmm. piece. Right. I think and we were joking about that as uh, relationship libertarianism. <laughs> oh, God, yeah. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if anybody calls themselves that, but that that is how I think right. of like the autonomy without the accountability. And what's so funny is if you look at the history of the word libertarian, it was the word that anarchists in some country in Europe started using because anarchism was outlawed. Oh, oh that's wow! I didn't know that. I didn't know that either. Huh. Yeah, it wasn't just something my dad came up with to annoy me. Then, <laughs> no, no, it actually like it's it's so it's been very interesting to learn that history and then to see people I know who identify as libertarians just be like, so we're actually like so the political spectrum is not a line; it's a circle, and if you gave a shit about other people. You can still keep your guns. Like, don't worry. I'm not going to take them from you. But like, if you feel like growing food and sharing with other people, like, just, just come on over here. Like the, like, right. And uh, some <laughs> we're so close. We're so close. <laughs> we're actually a lot closer than you think. Be- and I have experienced this because I grew up in a rural area and, um, like it's, I literally had this conversation with someone <laughs> who was like, You identify, like, I was like, you identify as a libertarian, I identify as an anarchist. Like, we're not that different. I just want to farm with other people. (laughs) Like, I don't want to do all this by myself. And he's like, you know what, actually, 
and like our families are interrelated um in not like a actual genetic way but in a like the family's lives have all been like intertwined over multiple generations um and like looking at our family's interrelationships we do work together we do support each other like two of my uncles like lived with his aunt and uncle who were like my god grandparents like there is this interdependence that our that was in our families and that if he thought about it for two seconds he and and just in seeing him he would bend over backwards to help people right he wouldn't think about it too like like he would just, he just do it right and there's a there's that generosity that i see and i think i think people have been punished for their generosity people have been burned people have been hurt um for being generous or have been hurt and punished for not being generous enough right and so um yeah i just think it's very interesting if we if we come back around and we say hey it's okay to give a shit about people because we can take care of you too. Um, I think that's really scary for people, um, but has been a real integral part of my healing process through a bunch of different hurts and um, is what I see as kind of the gift of relationship and anarchy broadly yeah and i think you're touching on a piece of this that i had written down a bunch of times um in various ways which is we're also talking about trauma and attachment trauma and those things are showing up in how you discuss our relationships the systems that they live inside when alex you were like these are hard conversations they feel really vulnerable i don't know how to have them partly that's a lack of practice that's cultural um that's us being told that that's taboo, in fact. Mm -hmm. Partly it's because we are in trauma territory pretty quickly mm -hmm. for a lot of people and especially mm -hmm. attachment trauma. And so just noticing that as well uh, and how it can be hard to talk about these things because we've been really harmed mm -hmm. in these areas and we've lost language, which is also a trauma response. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm thinking about this I'm thinking about this in relation to, I use the word of relation a lot, apparently. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Appropriately. <laughs> um, I'm thinking about this in relation to my understanding of responsibility and mm. how, like, there's so many good points in what you were saying. Like, I'm like, there's a part of me that's like literally right now, like realizing that I have a whole grieving process of what are the ways that my ancestors used to care and hold for each other and that Catholicism and Christianity and capitalism took away, you know, like, and feudalism and, you know, like what are, yeah. What are those ways that we used to have? What are the practices that we used to have? What are like that we just don't have anymore? Like I, I grieve about the songs that we, we would have had when we were doing various activities together. Like I, and I didn't realize that I needed to grieve the relational practices that my ancestors had. Um, so I'm going to do that. Um, probably yeah. later today. Uh <laughs> <laughs> Because well. there is, thank you. No, thank you, thank you, thank you. Like there is, there is so much intergenerational trauma that that we have and that mm -hmm. we hold in our bodies and in our psyches and in our minds and our fingernails. And like, I say that kind of flippantly, but also like in reality, like, and I want us to heal from that i want our relationships to be trauma informed i want vulnerability that people share to be honored i want i want a lot of things for a lot of people because i think yeah philosophically i i i want to think i don't always believe this um 
but my aspiration is that I want to believe that if we can, through relationships with each other, if we can heal these centuries of intergenerational trauma, that is one way towards creating a world where oppression doesn't exist. Yep. Yeah. And I think also the recognition, as you were describing, the intertwining of your family with this other family and the community that's been there. Anarchy and anarchism is also a constant reminder to me that we actually do know how to do these things. Mm -hmm. In fact, we all do come from histories and traditions of doing these things because this is a very natural and I would argue like instinctual way for people to organize themselves, Mm -hmm. which is around mutual aid and care and resource sharing um, and the understanding that we are all just as vulnerable as our most vulnerable members. I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a powerful uh, and I think more accessible way to live than we sometimes realize. And so I just want to remind people that we can be intimidated by these words, but this is like, this is our heritage. This is also where we all come from. We have these skills and like there's grieving to be done. Um, there is like recovery and repair. And also this is not foreign to anyone. Not at all. It's making me think about what you were saying when we were talking about this last night, just like about, uh, you know, ways that your grandmother and her sister like lived in community together in a very non-traditional way. And I think like most people have a story like that, even if they're really in the middle of like sort of white American culture that seems very like it's been very cooker cookie cutter. It's like it's not none of it is really that far away. It's like. No. Uh, a lot of those concepts are pretty newly introduced. And also, even since they have been, people have been living in different ways that are, you know, mutually caring, that, that were, quote unquote, kind of weird. But, uh, you know, it's it's been there. It still is there. It's been there longer than a lot of these oppressive systems. Yeah. 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 I'm just like... I'm really enjoying this conversation. Thank you so much. Um, Me too. <laughs> thank I knew you. this in a way I didn't realize. Um, thank you. Um, I really needed to hear we are as vulnerable as our vulnerable members. Um, I needed to hear that because I am in a bunch of different spaces and communities and things like that where it feels like I'm constantly fighting with mm. people to not decide that I am worth sacrificing on the altar of normalcy. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I'm like, I think part of why I don't really look at the smorgasbord as a thing for me anymore is because I have had to accept to some degree that the majority of my social needs are incapable of being met. Um, and I also know that that is a, there is a deep and embodied harm that is happening every day because of that. Like, I'm, I'm not going to get into it, but there's a whole bunch of like physiological responses that I'm having because there are so few spaces that are at all safe for me to exist in. Um, and so often it feels like people are either actively sacrificing me or are not really seeing me as a real member of the community. So they don't understand and, or they don't have this collectivist idea of we are as vulnerable as our vulnerable members. Like, Mm -hmm. um, so recently I've been doing a series of, relief prints which look like woodcuts i'm just not using wood um i'm using linoleum purpose made for that purpose it's very soft um and i've been making a series of of these relief prints of statements that i think are very important and usually it's things that i need um like one of (laughs) them is um we get our needs met by communicating our needs and the people who care will thank will will thank me I I get my needs met by communicating my needs and people who care will thank me. 
Mm -hmm. Um, and I have another one that's just me like, thank you for your boundaries. I already, I heard that this weekend. I'm adding that to my list. And I'm also adding, we're as vulnerable as our, our, our most vulnerable members. (sighs) Getting back into the kind of spiritual practice of this. My art is a spiritual practice by drawing these words over and over again to get them to lay out just the right way that I want them to and then carving them into an oleum and then printing them. This is a very like belabored process intentionally because I am investing each and every line of that design with a, an immense amount of intention that I really want to get out into the world. It's not like it's printmaking. It's so that you can make many copies because it is not a design that exists in one place. It is a, a design that can exist in many places simultaneously. Um, um, time at that to the smorgasbord. As soon as I have done an update to the smorgasbord, I put it out there as widely as possible. I make it available yeah. as widely as possible. Um, I have worked with people all over this planet to make translations of it in as many languages as people want to translate because I am an American that was not raised bilingually so I'm not fluent in any other languages than English so I'm not capable (laughs) and I don't have a budget to pay people to translate but people who also understand that this is a labor of love to the world and to the community of people who also want to be more intentional about how we relate to one another, um, those folks who are doing the translation work are also doing this as a labor of love. Like some of them been like, you don't need to credit me. I'm like, please, please let me know how to credit you because this is important work. (laughs) I understand that this is, um, a gift to the community and your gift need like should be honored for what it is. Um, like we, we, we minimize the work that we do by minimizing ourselves. <sighs> Thank you, Bex. I am, would love to see some of your art. Is there, where is, is there a place oh, yeah. to see it? On Instagram, right? Yeah, yeah. You can find my art on Instagram. Um, I think it's just at Max Hill Create. So Max has two X's, Hill has two L's, as it usually does. Um, <laughs> Um, and then the word creates, um, with an S at the end. Um, and that's where I will post updates to the s'mores board. Um, the last update, when did I do the last update? Did I date this? Was I smart about that? I was. So two years ago, um, was the last update. Mm -hmm. I have not got as many notes since the last update as I did for even the one before, um, but I welcome feedback, suggestions, ideas, commentary, questions, manifestos, etc. I like, I want to have conversations about this. I want to make this better so that it works better for more people. Um, and the, the, my biggest thing is that this is a gift to the community and I don't, I never want people to charge for it. Like, like I want it to be freely available. Well, any and all links that you have related to this and your work, we will put them in our show notes for sure. Um, I just feel really appreciative of the work you've done to, to put the resource together and, and share it so freely. I do think it's, it's extremely valuable. And as we've sort of played around with it, uh, in like our, our relationship and others, it's, yeah, it's just fantastic for people to, to have access to it. So thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. You're welcome. Um, as sort of a final thing, there are people who hate the smorgasbord, who don't like it, who don't want to use it. <laughs> of course. That's okay. I don't think it's like the, a be all end all. Fine. Great. You know, maybe they want to have a picnic instead of a buffet. Great. So happy for them. Like, I, I just, some people feel like they get a lot of pressure to use a smorgasbord. And I just wanted to make sure that I said, you don't have to. I don't even really <laughs> use it. Like... Um, you know, it's not a requirement. It's just a tool to help people communicate better and in a healthier way. 
So, and I've also really and like question the assumptions. Exactly. Like question the assumptions that they have going into relationships about what they what they should be, what they should contain, what they shouldn't contain, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. So, and I've also really appreciated this conversation. I have taken some notes of some things I need to think about um, in a good way. Likewise. <laughs> um, <laughs> and I really, have, I've thank you so much for reaching out. Um, thank you so much for this conversation um and for clearly the work that you're also doing in the world um besides this particular conversation um clearly you're y'all are thinking about things in an important way where you understand the power that you have with the tools that you are using and are trying to use them in the most responsible way that you can so that's that's not a small thing so I appreciate that. Thank you, Max. Thank you. I really appreciate that. And enjoy that summer vacation. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. That's the plan. That's the plan. <laughs> Thank you. I look forward to our paths crossing again. I bet they will. Oh, yeah. I'm looking forward to that. If you ever want me back, I'm, uh, I'm holding my thumb up. Um. <laughs> awesome. Well, we will be sending you that email. <laughs> Thanks so much for listening to Mistakes Were Made. You can find us on the gram at MistakesCast. <laughs> Email us at MistakesCast at gmail.com. Thanks so much for a great interview, Sarah, Alex, and Max Hill. See you next time. Thanks, everyone. Bye.